All right. Well, I am very pleased to welcome Melanie and Sarah and Jamie for today's um, awesome discussion. And, and please feel free at any point to type a question or comment in the chat. I know they definitely want folks to be able to, to chime in as well. So without further ado, I turn it over to these three amazing women. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Becky. So as we, um, as a group, the three of us, and also actually um, an additional subject matter expert for Survivor Space who wasn't able to be here with us today, Angie Khan, was part of these earlier conversations as well. Um, you know, in preparation for this um, session today, we started talking about instances when survivors may be contacted by their own former abuser. And that really was the heart of where um, we kind of got started with these conversations. Um, and so some of those examples might be very direct contact, like someone calling you or private messaging you. Um, some of those might be situations where you unexpectedly bump into someone in public. Um, some of them might be less direct, but still feel really intense. Like maybe you're scrolling social media and something sort of pops up in your feed that you weren't expecting to see. Um, so that's sort of the heart of where our conversation started as a group. And then through some of that dialogue and preparation for today, we saw so many additional directions that this conversation could go and ways that we took that conversation offline. So um, certainly those of you joining us today, if you have questions or comments, um, please use the chat to help steer us in ways that will feel helpful for you, feel relevant. Um, because we, again, we, we all felt like there are so many different ways that sort of unwanted contact can, can impact us in, in different and unique ways. Um, through those conversations and preparation for today, we talked about um, situations where maybe an abuser is very publicly known, um, or maybe they're part of a community group, like a church space or a 12-step program or some space that you might really want to be able to participate fully, but then knowing that that person is there, it becomes complicated to navigate. Um, we expanded to talk about, you know, maybe there are situations where that individual is not even your own abuser, but maybe you just simply have knowledge that they are an abuser of someone. <laughs> maybe that's someone you know, maybe that's something that you, uh, someone that you aren't close to, but, but just knowing that information and holding that and then being in that shared space can be very triggering um, and may be difficult to navigate, even if it's not your own personal story to navigate. Um, I think in those early conversations that we had as a group, we talked about trying to remove some of the stigma and the secrecy around this topic. This is not a topic that any of us had really seen presented in a circle or a, a workshop like this, but so it's something that we all have had experiences with. And, and so we wanted to really normalize that for anyone who's watching or joining today. Um, just, you know, if you've found yourself even even not having direct contact, but maybe you just find yourself thinking about that abuser over the years, maybe wondering where they are now or Googling them or social media stalking them, kind of looking up their profiles just to get information about them. Um, all of that is really common. Um, and maybe that brings up a lot of mixed feelings, right, about like, I, I don't want contact with them, and yet I'm still sort of seeking out information about them. So some of that can be hard to sort of reconcile. Sometimes we might have thoughts about them, like, not wishing good things for them, you know, hoping that we find out that bad things are happening to them, maybe revenge fantasies about them. There's just so many things that we don't acknowledge or talk about a lot and that we wanted this to be a safe space today for us to kind of broach some of those topics. Um, yeah. So anyway, that is a long winded, um, long list of directions that we sort of in preparation had sort of thought directions we could go today. Really, our goal for today is just to have some open, honest dialogue among ourselves. And like I said, hopefully those of you who are in the chat will feel comfortable to join in as well um, and, and just kind of share the space about how we may navigate this stuff. I think for me too, um, you know, jumping into this conversation, I've probably thought of this on my own journey many times in, in all of those various ways or many of them. Um, and so my kind of like, Ex excitement, I guess, is not the best word, but like my um, kind of buy into this topic is from personal experience. And so, um, you know, I kind of jumped in with you, Sarah, on your initial kind of um, direction of this and thinking about, you know, I've been on my healing journey for 20 years now. And so thinking about all the different times and ways, whether I was seeking it out or 
um, just wanting to know early on, um, you know, where he was so that I could feel safe. Um, and then it turned into like, then it turned into like, is he doing well? I hope not. <laughs> and then, you know, now it's more of like, um, you know, I've kind of let a lot of that go. I don't search his, his name like ever anymore. Um, but then had had an experience where, um, you know, I saw a picture of him um, with a friend from college um, and she didn't know that he was connected to my abuse. She knew about my abuse, but did not know that he was the one. Um, she, you know, this was again, probably 15 years after the abuse. And so he had gone on with his life. I had gone on. She had, she had, gone on you know not knowing the connection there and so um that was really my jumping off point of like having this like again like stop stop searching stopped you know for safety reasons um because i've been safe for many years um but really having this unexpected contact um and and although he didn't contact me it felt too close to home because it was someone that i had been in college with and grew up with her family and her younger sister and um, i'm still connected with today and she had no idea all she knew was that he was very kind of forceful in his demeanor that night at a wedding that she was at and like not knowing the connection at all so um you know there was a heaviness about like you know, this is so many years later, how do she's in a space with him? Obviously, I see the picture. Um, it looked like he was like the videographer at the wedding. And so, um, you know, being able to like, wrestling, like, do I bring this up? Do I not? Like, she's an adult, do I need to protect her? Um, you know, there was a lot of and I was a child when this happened. And so like, maybe he's like, stopped hurting people. And I don't know. So there was a lot of like, complicated, complex, feelings around that um and I did end up calling her and letting her know and she, and that's when she told me like he was very forceful and wouldn't take no for an answer and so that was both not, like expected like I in my mind he was still the same person who hurt me but also like kind of discouraged because I'm like oh, he's still doing this out there just with people his own age you know and so it's just like um you know, it's just like all those feelings, like even if you haven't thought about it for years and then it like crosses your path unexpectedly. And so that was really my lens on this. And then kind of pooling into some of the other ways um, as we unfold, I'll probably share more examples, but just wanted to give like my perspective and how I got involved in this conversation. Yeah, <clears throat> I think too, my buy-in comes in from like personal experience and then also working with other people who have survived, you know, various things. Um, you know, I think like with trauma and like being a survivor, for me, there's like a lot of like anger in that. Um, and almost the anger comes from like, like I did not ask for this and like just listening to your story, Melanie, thinking about like just how much emotional space and like time and you know conflict and like tension that created for you um and it like makes me like angry for myself when I like have stuff like that pop up but it makes me angry for you too like that was like so much energy like into like this guy just being a videographer like at a wedding and it just you know, sent you into this like spiral of like, do I tell her? Do I not tell her? What does this mean? Um, happen to, you know, rethink about the abuse that occurred. Um, so yeah, just coming in with a psych like, perspective of like, that we even have to like be having like conversations like this. And we have to be like navigating a world where like at any point in time, we can potentially feel unsafe or have to like, um, relive things that have happened to us. Um, I know for me, um, I have like several examples of like unwanted, like contact with like abusers. Um, but for a while, especially, um, really early in my recovery, I like spent time in like 12 step programs. Um, and there was like a youth group that I really like enjoyed going to. Um, and I remember going there one time and there was um, a former abuser who also, you know, went there. Um, and it was really, like, frustrating. And um, I definitely had, like, a trauma response. It was really difficult to see him. 
I eventually stopped going to places where I thought he would show up or like frequented often. Um, and I remember going to like an event that like I didn't anticipate him being at. Um, and he was there. And not only was that he there, he was like talking to like one of my friends. And it was like, all right, well, now like I have to do something like um this is not a man who should be talking to like my friend who's in like her 20 somethings. Um, you know, it had been years since I had had contact with him, but um I remember like walking up to her and they were like talking. He was like right there. And I was like, hey, come on, like we have to go. Like you can't, like you shouldn't be talking to this guy, like in front of him. And so we never actually like communicated. Um, and I think that was like the last time I saw him, but it was definitely like the most intense um, because like I, just because of who I am, I have this like sense of like justice and like, you know, felt protective of my friend. It's like, this is not somebody like, um, and you know, the truth of the matter is like in 12 step programs, there's a lot of abusers who show up in those like spaces, but like, this was like a guy I knew about and like, I could do something. Um, and so I did, but it came at a cost to myself, you know, on one side, I felt like good about myself because like I had stood up to him, um, in this like really direct way. And at another time it was like super scary. And, um, yeah, brought up all these like emotions um, and made me think of like, you know, abuse that I had um, had from him. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely brought into this topic, too, from like personal experience and for like wanting to stand up for others and help other people try to navigate this like difficult topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it's um, a, like Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, go ahead, Melanie. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, like, there's another sense of, like, um, re-victimization or violation, you know, when you're faced with it again. And, like, in a similar context, like, in a faith community. So I found my, my faith is part of my healing journey. So basically to heal from what he did to me. And, um, you know, many years later, I, I got wind that he was attending a church. Not my church, nowhere near me. Um, but that he, the fact that he had like the a similar faith or like was in those same spaces, even if it was not my space, like it still felt um, like, like um, violating in a way like that I was kind of like, he can't have the same faith that I do because I'm literally clinging to it to heal from what he did to me. So it's just so complicated um, and just brings up, like you're saying, Jamie, like a lot. And like the same way that you said, like you had anger for me, like I'm feeling that for you, like listening to your experience. And so I think there's like a, and there's like a fighting spirit within us as survivors of like, I want to stand up for not only myself once I've kind of moved through my own journey, but to protect others, like, because if they don't know, they, they don't know, and they may not know until it goes bad you know and so it's like really this um and so that was it's bold and courageous to do something like that and like um when you were saying like the cost I can so relate because I've talked a lot especially recently about like the cost of surviving um and so that is one of them of like reliving it at different points with different things um and there's also a literal cost to heal and so um thank you for bringing up that point because I think that is a very real and relatable, like the cost of surviving and what does it cost us to be bold and courageous? What does it cost us to uh, face these things head on? Um, because we feel the responsibility, even though we were the ones that were victimized. And so um, I just think there's a lot there um, that is very relatable for the, regardless of where you are on your healing journey. And so um, I think that was a great point. So you um, actually went exactly where my head was at. Um, as both of you guys were talking, I was kind of like jotting down notes. And one of the things that I jotted down on my pad in my lap was, um, at, but at what cost, right? Mm -hmm. And so through all of these situations, it's like, it, it's remarkable. Like it's, it's amazing in that situation to be able to call that other person who you saw the photo with, you know, or in person live stand up in that situation and say, come on, we're getting out of here. Um, but there's so much emotional bandwidth that goes into managing that in the moment, in preparation for it, in processing it afterwards, right? Like 
the burden continues to fall on survivors to be the ones who are doing that, right? Like, like the, the perpetrator who is just like navigating these spaces is not carrying that burden. Right. And so then it just also takes me that place of like, in addition to the remarkable way that in those two examples that we're talking about so far, um, you know, you guys both move forward with on some level, you know, addressing it head on. Um, it's also not our jobs to do that, right? Like it, there may be situations where that cost is not something that we're in a position to tackle, right? And so also helping people to know, like you don't have to carry guilt or some sort of like moral burden in that situation. The burden is not on survivors to fix all of these situations, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's great that there are some situations where we can come forward and say something and, and fight for justice. And also there are situations where that may not be safe um, physically, emotionally, psychologically. Um, there may just be other cost burden associated with it that is not ours to carry. I definitely agree with that. Melanie and I um, were talking earlier and we were talking about like, so what happens if like an abuser, whether it's like, someone who personally abused you or someone you just know is an abuser who has abused someone else or like other people, like what happens when those people like show up in spaces and like, you have to like make a choice. Um, and Melanie was like in one camp and I was like, you know, in this other camp of like, oh, for me, I would like totally avoid like, um, like avoidance is, it gets like a bad rap, I think, um, in like, you know, wellness, but I'm like, no, avoidance is like a, a great tool. Like if I can easily avoid something, I'm, I'm in like sign me up. But then it also made me start thinking about like, oh, well, I live in like a major city with over like a million people. There are so many alternatives like that are available to me. So if I like show up in a space um, and there is someone who like exists who like has abused me or I know is an abuser, it's fairly easy for me to be like, okay, well, what other space can I occupy to like avoid these encounters? But then thinking about people who might live in like smaller communities um, or might have like more like niche interests where there's like less like choice. I, I brought up the example of like rock climbing but like even in Jacksonville and there's like two rock climbing gyms and so if like I really wanted to rock climb but there was like an abuser who went to this like one gym I would have to drive like 30 minutes across town to go get to the other like gym um so for me like I weigh like those costs like Sarah and I'm like most of the time it's not worth the cost for me to like try to address this or try to like navigate like avoidance is the thing that has like the least cost personally for me but like what happens like when you can't avoid or like how do you navigate that um and Melanie was definitely in the other camp of like well you know I deserve to be able to take up whatever space I can so I'd love to hear from you Melanie, yeah. how, what that looks like yeah and my first thought when we had that conversation was like I don't want that person to take anything else away from me. And, and so like that, and again, like in the same, there is a cost associated with that. Um, the only like concrete example I can think of is like, I played softball my whole life and um, where one of my instances of abuse happened was on one of the soft, like right outside one of the softball fields, like in the woods right there, kind of to the left of the outfield. And like, for, I had to weigh this cost of like, am I going to continue playing when we play at this field or am I going to sit those games out or am I going to quit completely, <laughs> you know? And so um, I landed kind of in the middle there um, leaning towards like, I'm not so, so I started with like, I'm, I had to talk to my coach or had my parents talk to my coach. I was pretty young um, that I could not play when we were, cause I was in the middle of a trial and things like that. And so it was just really hard to like, cause I was a pitcher. And when I would walk back to the pitching mound, I could see the spot where I was 
sexually assaulted. And so I had to really like, I couldn't for, for a while, I couldn't, even though like I wanted to, cause I was like, I don't want to, I was angry and I wanted, didn't want him to take anything else away, but I actually couldn't. And the cost was too great. Um, but then as like my healing journey unfolded, I started like taking that back as power of like, I'm going to get in that circle on that field. And so like, I started playing again the following season um, at that field and like, and then like, I actually went back there as part of a therapeutic thing, like by my own choice to like process some things. So like, it was a like progression. Um, It started as like the cost isn't worth it. Then it became, it's worth it to me. And then it became like, I'm actually willing to go back there to like really dig into it. Um, But you know, there's other examples that could, you know, and I think that's like my first, my first thought is like being in the opposite camp of like, I don't want him or them to take anything else away from me and so um you know even in like because I asked the question um because I moved to another state and that's where I kind of defined my faith journey in a real way but I was like if I ever moved back to my home state like what would I do if I saw him in a church setting because it was very possible um, because of the proximity and I said I'd stay like I was confident that I would stay I haven't had to do that but um and so it's just like you know, in that, and then other people may be like, no way would I say like, there's other churches like all set, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, I think it's beautiful that we can have like the, and it, it could be for different things. Like there's some things that wouldn't be worth the cost for me. Like if we were on the same like co-ed softball team, I'd probably tap out, you know? Um, but like, if it was like a bigger setting where I had my people surrounding me, like, I think I might be more apt to say like, I'll stay because you're not taking this away from me if I've already established a community in this space. So there are many different variations of that. I'm sure we can all describe and relate to. Um, but yeah, that's my take on that. Well, I would say for me, what unites those, like on the surface, you guys are saying these are opposites, but I think that the core of what unites those in common is the empowerment, right? Because for Jamie, you're saying like, it's very empowering to actively intentionally choose to not go to a place because I have the power to choose to invest my resources in a different location or in a different activity, right? Um, And then Melanie, for you, it's just saying I'm, I am empowered to choose to stay because I'm, I'm feeling strong and confident and comfortable to make that choice. I feel empowered to do that and not, not giving up that space. So it's like both of those come back to that feeling of power and intentionality about choice and not, um, not feeling like you have to leave or have to stay, but I choose to stay. I choose to leave. Um, a big takeaway I had from what you were, um, talking about Melanie was just like the fluidity of it too it's like I don't have to be like locked into a choice and at like different points in my like journey I can like make different decisions and like as the context changes like you know maybe that'll influence things I also am just thinking too about like the way um I did this survivor circle with Melanie Varney a little bit ago and we like overviewed this research paper on like grooming um and one of my big takeaways from that paper was that um people who like abuse don't just groom like individuals like the people who they're targeting um, to be their victims they also like groom communities um so thinking about um this really like tragic situation that happened to like my friend um and this guy she married and like things that ended up happening um this guy was like really prominent in the community as far as like in the church, like leading youth groups, like doing different like ministry things. And no one would have ever suspected like what he was like really up to. Um, And so it is like possible, you know, that um, I mean, I think really common that abusers will end up being these like prominent people in like communities or like engage in these activities, like going to church. Um, it's because they're trying to groom the community. They're trying to like get that image of like, oh, there's no way that could have been him. There's no way that he he would do something um, like that. Um, so. Yeah. And so then when we do um, have any of these type of experiences where then there are other people involved, um, then it's like, 
well, now this unwanted contact that I'm having with this abuser in whatever setting, church or um, a family get, get together or a social media space, whatever. Um, well, so now I'm in this situation where am I going to disclose? Um, if so, like, was I intending to disclose to, to these people ever? <laughs> Certainly probably not in this exact moment, but how I choose to navigate the situation and what feels like the safest choice for me or what I want to avoid or what I want to stay involved in or whatever those choices are, right? Then I'm having to potentially involve other people who are also part of that community who have also likely been groomed to your point, Jamie, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm having to do a lot of navigating, not just my own personal navigating, but navigating all these other relationships that are part of the web. I know we talked about like in our conversations leading up to this, um, we're talking about a lot of like, kind of like real life examples, um, but also just thinking about like social media and how that like plays out. Um, I don't have like, I don't think I have any personal experiences other than like maybe someone popping up and like people you may know. Um, but what does like unwanted contact like via social media, like look like, and how do you like navigate, navigate that? Yeah. I mean, it can look like a friend request all of a sudden and you're like, bro, you are not a friend. <laughs> like what is happening? Right. Um, it can look like a, a message that gets, you know, slid into the DMS, um, that now, again, all of these, it's like, now the burden is back on me. Am I going to choose to accept or decline? Am I going to block? Am I going to respond to this message? Like there, that, that burden, right. That cost is, is back on the survivor to figure out, well, now the ball is back in my court. Like I didn't ask to be playing tennis right now. And yet the ball is in my court and I have to figure out what to do with it. Right. Yeah, and even like social media is often like, uh, you know, everybody says like a highlight reel. And so, you know, even if you're like a survivor seeking out information about your abuser or if that unexpected contact comes in and then you start to like, oh, let me click on it and see what they're up to now since they're in my inbox or they've come across my plate. I might as well just, you know, I've done that, you know, I'll admit to that, like, and that's okay, like, but um sometimes you find out things you don't want to find out like that they're like happy and married and have kids you know and um you know I know that was really hard for me like on my journey um because I struggled with so many physical ramifications from my assault my assaults and abuse and um you know one of my abusers like ended up like having a child at one point and I saw that and it was just like I'm over here like spending thousands of dollars on medical care because of what you did to me <laughs> and like therapy and the cost, like for the literal costs. And like, you're out there just like having a kid and look, look great, you know? And so it's, you know, there's a um, difficulty there with the social media piece, um, you know, of seeing like, you know, you're like behind there, like maybe hoping that they're not doing great. And like, you wouldn't really necessarily see that on social media, but you might. And so you're like kind of hoping for that. But then when you get the opposite, it's kind of like difficult, but it's like, but then you're like, I'm a horrible person. Cause I'm like wishing ill on someone, but then it's like complicated. And so it's like, you know, again, that burden again, falls back on the survivor um, to kind of feel that like go through all of that, those peaks and valleys of, of that contact, whether it was like th through, friends you may know or friend requests or me direct message or just stumbling upon it somehow or seeking it out um and so it's just like you know it's not only unwanted contact but it's like unwanted information um and hoping the information would have been maybe different and then you know then if you do see they're like you know not doing well then it's like the fact that you're like kind of happy about that it's <laughs> like you know another complicated thing to walk through so I think um, social media can be very tricky even if it's not a direct contact even if you just see it as a survivor um, it can be really really hard or like seeing them being supported by people in what they're doing you know or like accolades or positions that they hold or jobs that they have or um, you know 
even if, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it hits a little harder if you're actually struggling at the time, but like, if you're like living your life and doing the same things, like having accolades and having, you know, things like, it can be like, I don't want them to feel the same way I do right now with like all that's going well in my life. So there's like the ifs and ands and buts and all of the things, like it can be very complicated for the survivor to navigate. I think even, Go ahead, I was just say like super quick, like even proactively on the front end of that too, survivors who are like, well, I'm going to just avoid, so I'm not going to have a social media presence because I don't want an abuser to be able to stumble upon it or find it or operating on a very like limited locked down basis to where people aren't able to search for you or, you know, all of the privacy controls that people use. So, and some of that being for legitimate safety concerns too, um, not just avoiding unwanted contact, but, you know, truly for safety reasons. I had a similar thought too of like even proactively thinking through like what names do you use on social media and like how searchable are you and like are you easy to find on social media? Um, I've always had the problem of having a a unique name Um, so like very easy to find like on the internet and just having to like make choices around by my internet use to once again like to proactively like avoid unwanted um, unwanted contact. Yeah. Just checking to see, it doesn't look like we have any comments in the chat yet. I'm just going to re-invite those of you who are joining today. If any of this is resonating or bringing up thoughts or questions, please do feel free to use the chat, um, because we would be happy to respond to stuff in real time or save some time at the end either way. Yeah, especially if there's like um, a nuance on this topic that we haven't like covered or or shared, we would love to to go into um, deeper conversations and areas that are important to you. One of the things that we haven't touched on yet that I think we we did in prior conversation before, you know, in preparation was the idea of um, not just these instances where it got sprung on us or um, surprised or unwanted contact, but some situations where we may know in advance, like, okay, well, there's this family reunion or a wedding or a funeral or whatever the case might be, right, where it's like, I am anticipating that this individual will likely be there. Some of those might be smaller um, or private settings. Some of them might be large community events, again, depending on who your abuser was and and what their role in your community or your family or your network looks like. Um, But going back to that idea of kind of navigating and making choices, like how do we want to um, make a decision in advance? Am I going to attend this or not? If so, who do I need to tell and what information do I need to disclose to them in advance and how do I need to build a safety plan into this or a support network for myself? Um, I don't know if you either you want to share thoughts on that, but I know that's also in the, in the collection of topics of unwanted contact, it may not be unexpected, but it's unwanted. I was just, I mean, even go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. I was thinking about like family, like relationships too, especially if an abuser is like a family member. Um, but then you have other family members who don't who want to like keep that hush hush and keep that quiet. And so then it makes like navigating those spaces and navigating disclosure, you know, that much more complicated um, when there's like all these like family dynamics involved. Um, I think all of this, like all of this unwanted or like unplanned contact almost puts survivors in a space where they have to navigate like disclosure. Disclosure feels like it keeps coming up. Like if I'm not going to play softball, like at this particular field, then I have to talk to someone and how much do I share? And if I'm not going to go to this particular like 12 step group because someone is there, then how much do I have to share to like explain that? Um, Mm -hmm. Or like if it's a family member um, and I have other family members who are just want to be willfully like ignorant or like protective of this person. um, And it goes back to like, what is the cost? Like, um, like, do I just stop? attending like family events and then do I get 
separated from that community? Is that a community that I want to be a part of if they're protecting an abuser? Um, so just all these like dynamics are just, it's so complicated and like so much navigating to navigate and so challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I've thought about this, like in the context of like preparation, um, you know, even, you know, outside of like direct, like abuse, um, like, a. I was in a toxic work environment at one time and like thinking about like thinking about it in that context like if I were to see any of those people because that's a very real possibility I'm I'm still around where that happened and so like how would I navigate that and like my hope would be that my husband would be with me because I've thought about like what what word would I use to be like let's get out of here <laughs> kind of thing um so I think that can apply to this um you know and how you know, what would your, who would your person be? Hopefully you'd be with them, but you can't predict that. Um, so always thinking about like, who would your person be if you're like potentially going to be in that position? Um, what would your word be to like, let's get out of here? Or what would that be? That safety plan, like Sarah was talking about, um, you know, I've thought of that in a very like outside of, cause I'm not worried about like a, my abusers specifically, um, but just like in other contexts that were like really, awful and hard um what would happen if I ran into those people and you know how would I navigate that um you know because I don't want kind of my anger about the situation or my betrayal to get the best of me and then end up in a worse position you know um and also to get out of there without without incident in any way um and to feel you know safe in my own community and um empowered in my own community and you know confident you know going into those spaces where I, I do have a seat, you know, and um, yeah. So just thinking about it in that context, a little sidestep from direct abusers, but um, just like even toxic situations, people, difficult things, all of the above, I think it can apply. So. Yeah. I think that's a really good point because um, it's easy to get triggered by something that relates to your abuse that's not your actual abuser, right? So you may be in a social setting and that person is not there, but maybe there's someone there who elicits that reaction from you. It, it could be a complete stranger you've never met, but maybe they physically look similar or wear the same cologne or, you know, speak with the same dialect or like whatever, There's there could be stuff there that's triggering for you. Maybe the environment itself, you weren't anticipating, but for whatever reason, it's just, it's one of those days where you're feeling triggered by stuff and- stuff is coming up for you, that person may not be there physically, but psychologically, emotionally, mentally, it feels like that, that presence is hanging over you. Yeah. I wonder if um, either of you would like to speak to this. I know we had talked a little bit before in our conversations about um, some of the burden of carrying um, some of those like internal conversations that we may be having in our own mind towards that person, whether it's actually going and searching out information about them or whether it's just an internal monologue of like things that we say to ourselves about them. Um, and just thinking about the ways, you know, as a therapist, there are some forms of therapy where people will even sort of assign a homework assignment of like write a letter to these people from your your past. Um, not that you're necessarily going to deliver the letter to those people, but that exercise of kind of expressing that. Um, sometimes those are just conversations that we hold in our mind, but it can feel very real um, that 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 interaction and especially if that mental conversation or that letter that you're writing is generated based on some kind of content that happened, right? So I received a phone call or a text message and now I'm scripting out in my own head, like this perfect response of like, well, I wish I had said this back to them or here's what I would say if I had the chance or those kind of conversations. Yeah, I think um, I've definitely had those like that internal like dialogue with myself where I'm a really like empathetic person. So I think there's um, 
ways in which I try to like understand like from like the abuser's perspective, like what happened and um, not to excuse what they did or anything like that, but just to have like some sense of understanding um, all the way back to like, I hope the worst and most awful thing in the world happens to you. I hope you end up in prison for a long time. Like, so just having that like, kind of like dichotomy of like, I hope like they suffer the way I suffered and also trying to have like understanding and empathy like for their play and kind of just going back and forth between those two kind of like extremes I think most of the time I just don't think about it but I think if I'm like asked to think about it or like something prompts it um I have just my very like logical like empathetic self trying to kind of explain things and like make meaning of it. And then that very like emotional, like responsive of like, no, I've suffered for a long time in ways like they can't even imagine. Um, and I want them to like suffer in the same type of way. Um, and I do think that's like really normal. And I think that part of me that's like angry is like, the part of me that like understands what happened to me isn't okay. Um, and it's like my sense of justice kind of comes from that part. So I don't think the anger is like bad or like wrong. I know we can like assign like, you know, buckets, like these are the good emotions, like, and these are like the bad emotions, but I'm like, no, I think that the anger might be unpleasant for me to experience it, but there's a reason it's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would completely agree. I've swung the pendulum like through all of those things. And I think, you know, that is the journey of like, I've had both and thoughts about this one person or this one, you know, and um, even in the same breath, you know, I've thought like, I hope you're miserable because I'm miserable. <laughs> but I also am like, well, you were hurt as a child too. And, um, you know, from that, like, compassion standpoint, and, like, have you changed? You're going to church now. Have you actually changed? Like, but then there's, like, the concrete example of, like, you're at this wedding and not taking no for an answer, so you haven't changed, and it's back to the anger. But then it's, like, but also you were still hurt as a child, you know? And so, like, swinging back and forth, I don't think it's, like, I'm, like, one place and then another place, but I feel like it's a pendulum. It's, like, I can go to you know, that, um, that anger place and that justice place, but I can also go to the compassion of, and that, you know, that can set me free from some of it in some ways. And then this can like, keep me where I, you know, where I need to process some things and go back to this free place. And, you know, you know, it can be back and forth, both. And, um, I think I've experienced that, um, many times <laughs> going through, um, even in the same setting or the same, same moments, uh, going back and forth between the two so yeah there's a ton of honesty and vulnerability in um, both of those answers so thank you for sharing those perspectives because I think that that richness of the conversation of it's both and right like the healing is going to be this messy journey and there's all of these parts to it and uh, it's not just going to be some clean tidy little fit in a little box and here it is you know <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's, I, I, I agree. I think that there is this, uh, complexity of being able to understand, right. And cognitively to be able to think my way through certain things or, you know, versus like some of those emotions that get a little more raw that can kind of come out sometimes, especially if you're, um, you know, in a situation where you're feeling very triggered or whatever. Um, but even just in a normal day-to-day -day life, this, the pendulum swings all day, every day for all of us. For sure. So we still have some time, but as we start moving towards closure and wrapping up and then saving some time in case anyone wants to, to chat or in case Becky has any questions to come back on with, um, do we want to start our sort of wrap ups of like what our takeaways are or what we hope people are able to take away from our, our session today? 
I think my biggest like takeaway is like, however you navigate it and like whatever comes up for you is like, okay. And it's probably, um, like survivorship can feel really like isolating sometimes. Um, but like spaces like survivor space, you know, where we can come together and say like me too, um, and not just like me too, because we've experienced abuse, but like me too, as in like, no, like I feel that way too, of just like, these things are really common. They're not things you have to like navigate on your own and other people have like experienced them. Um, so just kind of like normalizing, um, but like, if you choose to avoid, if you choose to confront, if you choose to like disclose, like for me, it's like, this is something that you shouldn't ever have to be doing. Like, and however, like you choose to like navigate that is like, okay. And like, have your people, you know, whether that is like a therapist or like a support person, um, to help you like talk through those like decisions. I know for me, like the story at the very beginning that I told about this guy in like 12 step programs, I didn't really have like the language of like trauma back then. I just was feeling everything happen like in my body. Um, and it didn't like make sense. And I didn't understand like why I was having such like intense emotions like around it. Um, and so I was able to like share and I had like understanding people in my life, but like fast forward to where I'm at now, if I was like in a similar situation, I feel like I have like language and understanding and like people to help like guide me through that a lot better than I did mm -hmm. like back then. So like support systems are just really like important too. And like, so I guess for one, like no that everything that you're experiencing is normal, like how you choose to navigate it, navigate it is like valid and that you don't have to do it alone. Um, and it's better when you have a support system. I'm sorry, that was like three takeaways. So I apologize, that was a lot of takeaways. <laughs> you're allowed all the takeaways. You can have 10 takeaways, takeaways. 15, yeah. go crazy. <laughs> I love that. Um, and I would just say, you know, I love Jamie, how you said earlier about like, you're not locked in, like you're not locked into your, decision um and I think that goes for me is something I say all the time like healing is not linear but it's worth it um you know like it's not a linear like okay I made this one decision about this thing but like if I was faced with that exact same decision 10 years later I can change my response you know I can I can change how I would respond like maybe I would play in that softball game you know 10 years later, but maybe in those first couple of years, I couldn't. And so it's, um, you know, I think that's one of my biggest takeaways that it's not, you're not locked in. There's a freedom, there's a choice. And I think that is empowering for us as survivors that like, we didn't have a choice about our abuse or what happened to us. Um, but we, we do have a choice with our, like how we respond in our, on our healing journey and, and how, what serves us well and what doesn't and we have a choice to like tap out or tap in um, and that can change and that's not you know something that you have to like sign a document on about like I have to stay in this one lane you know and I think that's a beauty the beauty of freedom and the beauty of healing um, and the beauty of just like justice really too like I don't have to do this or I can, you know? And so I think that's one of my biggest takeaways. And if you're someone out there navigating this currently or will on your journey, like just know that you're not alone with even some of the more difficult or darker thoughts about that person or um, some of the harder things like the anger and the grief and the, you know, wishing, you know, they weren't happy, you know, those things are also, and again, the word, like, I think a lot of times I know for me, it, on my survivor journey I was like I was searching for normalcy I wanted to feel normal I wanted to feel like you know like because this was such a thing that was the opposite of normal that happened to me and so it was like you know so I think it is in a lot of ways the word normal is not a great word but I think in this context it is because it's like you know what you're experiencing is like 
all of us can probably say yes to that in some form, like that you're not alone um, in your thoughts, in your actions, in your like difficulty of decisions um, and in the wrestling of that. Like you're not alone. You're not alone in the in-between, in the not knowing which choice to make, um, in the battle of that, um, to, to make the call to that person who's been in the same space as someone you know is unsafe um, to, to confront them. You know, you're not alone in like the the nitty gritty, like, back and forth that that can cause you or the different emotions um so yeah you're not locked in and um you know you're not alone uh, both gave really solid um wrap-ups you definitely hit some of the same points i would have made i i would add one that hasn't been mentioned yet is really giving yourself grace um mm -hmm. and knowing that it can feel like a lot of pressure if you're thrust into a situation and all of a sudden this person is there and like you weren't expecting it. And may maybe you, maybe you avoided, or maybe you stayed and said something or didn't say something. You can go back and like slice and dice that in your brain a million ways and um, feel a lot of pressure that like, uh, I, sh I had to, I should have responded in like the perfect way or, Oh, I wish I'd had this like perfect comeback or I should have known. I should have predicted they would be there. I should have avoided it from the beginning. Like you can, you can play all those mind games, um, but the burden should never have been on you. <laughs> this, right? This should not have ever been the survivor's job to navigate. Um, it has been thrust on you. And so here you are in this position of, of having to figure out what to do with that. So always knowing that no matter what you did or didn't say or do, um, there's, that's okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, Melanie, you said it's normal. <laughs> it, it's something that somewhere out there, there are other survivors in this community who have experienced the same or similar situation and have responded in the same or similar ways. Um, some of them may be celebrating that response. Some of them may be regretting it, but it, just having that space of, of forgiveness for yourself and of grace for yourself as you navigate it and um, there, knowing that there's no, there's no one right way to do it. Um, so if there's no one right way to do it, then you definitely didn't do it the wrong way. Um, yeah, I think that would be my, my final wrap up. So we'll pause for a second, see if there are any, um, questions from folks who are joining us today, or also Becky, if you have received any, or if you have any of your own that you want to, um, throw in the chat or hop back on the screen and share with us, that's fine too. And we've got a couple of minutes before we're completely done to wrap up for today. Great, thank you. I'm I'm keeping my video off just so folks can can concentrate on the three of you. Um, great, you know, great presentation. Yeah, I just I appreciate the both the like the logistics side of things, but also sort of the emotion side of things. How complicated it is when you have to navigate these situations and just I can you know personally thinking of my own experience feel that sense of like anger it's like I have to think about how I'm ordering my life to accommodate accommodate this person's space where they don't have to worry about it at all and it's yeah I can feel that for you all <laughs> and for myself As folks are uh, maybe continuing to think or reflect or maybe chime in in the chat if you would like to, um, did want to mention that we have um, a little written product that also came out of our brainstorming from um, getting ready for this event today. So um, if there are additional comments that do come in, we can add any of that to our document and then that can also be shared potentially through some of the social media channels or certainly on the website itself, along with some of the other tip sheets and things that are the resources that are on there to stay. Yeah. And folks are, are bef before you leave today, if, if this um, discussion has sparked um, an interest for you in related topics, feel free to drop that in the chat as well. If there's, you know, something that you would like us to focus on for a future survivor circle. We would love to hear that.
I know for me, I just want to say I'm really appreciative of Melanie and Sarah for like having this like conversation. Um, I'm glad that I got to, to be a part of it. Um, this isn't something that I've seen talked about a ton, but I think is like such a common experience, like for, um, for survivors of like, how do we navigate this? And like, um, I guess like one thing we didn't talk about is like, we're, we've been talking about these experiences, um, in that, like, my experience was, like, so much closer to, like, my abuse, but I think even now, I think just even normalizing that you can still have, like, mm -hmm. these same, like, feelings 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. like, later um, as well. Yeah. I think that's, like, something we haven't said, but, like, unwanted contact doesn't, can keep happening you know beyond like the first year the first five years or like 10 years later um you know it can be something that that goes on for a lifetime and it's okay to have those responses even decades away from like the abuse mm -hmm. yeah it's good Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and certainly if you have any um, you know, follow-up thoughts or questions, please um, you know, reach out and we'll be happy to, to answer that. Or uh, if you have ideas for, for similar discussions you'd like to see in the future, we would love to hear that as well. Thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you, Melanie and Sarah and Jamie for a great discussion. I'll put myself back on here. It's kind of strange. <laughs> Ignore, ignore the voice behind the, the curtain, right? <laughs> I will stop the recording now.